I want to talk about recording this, but did you did you play live as a five piece before you went in to do this, or, or, or was it or was it decided let's make let's re record this, let's make our mark? We played as a five piece. My first show with them was in was September nineteenth, nineteen eighty two. At Terminal 406 in ba in Baltimore, Maryland, Utah Street. It was this old furniture warehouse that had punk shows. Had a lot of punk shows. Right. Um, and we played with Scream. And it's the move. It's the it's the show that's in Another State of Mind. The movie Another State oh, of right Mind. right on. That's the show. Yeah. That was my wow. first show with them. We cool. played a lot of shows together before we recorded. Probably okay. For some reason, I thought maybe you guys. Oh just no. Went straight in. We we played a ton of shows. Crazy. We did. This is how I learned to do pre-production. Um, I always wanted to learn how to become a recording engineer and producer too. That was always one of my burning ambitions since I was like 10 or 11 years old. And I figured out there was such a job as recording engineer producer. I thought I want to do that too. And the way I learned was the pre-production that Lyle, especially pretty much as the musical director of the band, put us through in the months before we did the record, we were so prepared when we went in to record that. Right that on. we knocked it out in a couple of hours. Is that right? Hours. I mean, we, we, boy, we put a lot of work in. We played a ton of shows. Um, and, you know, one of the most amazing things about the fall of 82 for me, besides the fact that, oh, hey, by the way, you're a minor threat, was every other practice, Lyle would come in with a song. Like, I wrote this last night. What do you think? And he played It Follows. And I was like, uh, yeah. He's like, great. I, think, I think you should open it. You should open with a bass thing. I'm like, um, right. sure. And then he brought in Think Again. And I was, and he said, I think that we should have a breakdown. You play a bass solo in the middle of it. Okay. Like, you're going to say no. But every other practice he was bringing, and then he brought in Betray. And, and it just, and look, and then Brian wrote most of Look Back and Laugh. But we Frankensteined it together with part of one of Lyle's songs that we threw out. Sure. And the intro is a is a piano piece that Ian wrote that we heard him play that we loved and we stole it. And and it, you know, we just worked our asses off before we went in to do that record. Now, is this is this this is the actual recording? Is, this, is, is yes. this when Don's place was in the, in his house? It still it, it is again. It's, it's in again, his basement. It is again. But this yeah. is that's yeah, when it was when in his we, basement. Right. In his uh, in his his furnace room, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> that's where the control room is today. It's facing a different direction, but that but that's that, the control room. That, that's awesome. That so, was January 9th, nineteen eighty three. So let me get down. Let me get down to some 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 nitty gritty here. Sure. So this is a, this is a shot you sent me yep. of um of you playing. Yep. This is your Fender Precision bass. Yep. And is this is this the PV head? Yes, it is. So this PV head, yep. what you're, th this Fender Precision bass, that PV head, and what is that? What is that cabinet? It's a 215 EV. Okay. That was the Minor Threat bass rig. They bought it for Brian when they reunited. Okay. In, in and, the spring of 82. And that is this. Oh, yeah. That Woo! was um, that was very much on purpose. That had those PV heads, along with you know an actual real SVT head, are the best sounding bass head I've ever used in my life. I wow. could get my sound out of that with no problem. That sound was actually the cabinet was just for me to hear in the room. That little you can see a, a line out coming out of the yeah. Coming out of the, that was a, that was a direct out. An, an, an EQ'd compressed direct out from the amp, from the preamp section huh. that Don put directly into a, an old compressor and directly into the board. That bass sound is my bass into that head, the tap into the board. So, so the cab isn't mic'd at all. Not at all. It was just there for it was just there for me to monitor. Huh. And it weighed a ton. And those stairs were steep. They still are. I I'm like I insisted. He had a bass cabinet there. I could have used easy. 
but I insisted on using my live rig because everyone else is using their live rigs. And what year, uh, Michael LaRoche asked, what year was that P, is that P-Base? 1971 P-Base mm -hmm. with, um, that I had heavily modified with a, a Seymour Duncan 60s um, P-Base pickup and a black anodized pickguard and a Leo Kwan badass two bridge. Cause I wanted the very best. And I wanted a P-Base because John, John Entwistle played a P-Base. But more importantly, Algie Ward from the Damned on Machine Gun Etiquette played a P-Base. And that was the sound I was going for for Out of Step. And I achieved it. Yeah. And no, Larry Kelly, he wasn't using a Sanzan bass driver. It I do now. It, 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 did do not, now. it did not exist in 1982. No, but I do now. It, that I do now. And, so, and Holly uses one in our band now. She uses mine. I've been using a Sans Amp bass driver since 1993. That so is know, the best thing in the world. So, you know, we talked about, you know, that I was an antidote. And yep. uh, one of my childhood friends, um, Neil Zum Osberg, uh, created the Sans Amp bass driver. What? what? Yeah. He is my hero. Yeah, he's a lot of people's heroes. That is yeah. the best sounding pedal ever yeah. made for a bass. Yeah. He, I, uh, I don't he, do anything he, without it. And, and you know what? In our storage room, uh, in a storage room, we still have the, the the cab. We have the we call it the refrigerator. The Ampeg cabinet is still in the store. Is in Are our you storage. Are kidding room. me? We share a storage room. We still have it in the storage room. The, the, still the, the, in my heart. Yeah, I'm serious. And and, and so the and the and the SVT head, which we yep. call which we call the Widowmaker. Oh the yeah. Fucking, it's like a fucking. It's like a concrete brick. You got to carry this thing around. It'll kill you. You know? Yeah, I had I had two seventy one heads and cabinets for many years. Yeah, yeah. they're the bomb. Um, but that bass driver is the thing. That is, the, yeah, yeah. I wish. I mean, the thing is, I managed to get the sound on out of step using that setup that I actually emulate with a bass driver now. Yeah, yeah, right. So it's, it's a legit question. Yeah, because it does pretty much sound exactly the same. Were you, were you happy with the way that? this turned out and uh any, <laughs> any, I, I mean are you, i mean no <laughs> were, 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 right, right were you happy at the time and and in no. retrospect do you feel like it's aged well well here's the thing what went to tape what went to tape sounded fucking phenomenal hmm. and the proof is in what ian and don did with the out of step outtake seven inch because that sounds like what I heard in the control room the night we recorded it being played back in the, that picture that's the cover of Out of Step Outtakes is us listening to the playback of Betray. And which was the first song we cut that night. And yeah. what came back through that system. Now, Don, you know, at the time, you know, he had a hand, he, he had a hand wired board that he built himself. He had two power amps. These massive Macintosh power amps. Wow. And these beautiful JBL speakers. So what we heard coming back was sounded ungodly. It sounded mm. so good. That so what was on the time, tape, man. what we captured on the tape that night, what Don captured on the tape that night, sounded astonishing. Mm -hmm. But the mix they did, now what happened was we we recorded the record in one night. Lot, the All the music and the main vocals were cut live in the room. Good Lord, man. We cut them live in the room to 8-track, to Don's Tascam 8-track. Um, there was a laundry room off the off the main room there that Ian sang in. The rest of us were in the, the, uh, the play. His, his kid's playroom, essentially, was the tracking room. And um, we uh, I was the only one wearing headphones because we were all in this tiny room so we could hear each other. But I wanted to hear Ian because you couldn't hear him otherwise. But we were so tight that, you know, it wasn't really necessary to hear what he was singing because we knew it, we knew what to do. I wanted to hear it, which is why you see in that picture, I've got headphones. I was the only one wearing them. And I'm glad I did because Don and Ian, the entire time we were tracking, were basically fucking with each other. And it was hilarious. They were just backing and forth and bagging on each other and insulting each other and cracking these terrible jokes. And I'm the only one hearing it. And I'm dying. And Lyle's getting madder and madder at me. And you can hear it on the tape in between songs him like telling me to shut up and stuff, but it was hilarious. And I'm so glad that I did, but we cut everything live. We mm. took maybe four hours to do that record. 
The next both, night we came both, back. Yeah. Both guitars, both guitars, wow. rhythm tracks were done live. And then wow. what? Overdub, uh, an over, overdub guitar track? A couple of overdubs. There were very few overdubs. Wow. Um, the main overdubs were a couple of things. Lyle doubled a couple of minor things, like on Little Friend. Right. Um, and he, uh, Brian, most of the overdubs were Brian's solos on Cashing In. Right. He overdubbed all those solos. Each solo was done on a different guitar. He had he used um, a '57 Strat with a whammy bar. He used a Schecter with a first generation Floyd Rose for one song. We borrowed these from the Art Guitar Tech wow. a guy named Steve, Steve Mekelsethian, who ran Angela Instruments, which is where we bought all of our stuff. He did all of our tech work, <clears throat> and we just borrowed a bunch of instruments for him from him to do the overdubs, which was just basically Brian doing the solos on Cashing In. And then he had like a Les Paul Jr. copy that he played one of the solos on. And we just did a different pass on each one. But we cut everything live that first night on the 9th. And on the 10th, we came back in to do backing vocals, which I sang with Ian. Um, most of the most of the backing vocals were me and Ian. Yeah. Um, sometimes Lyle, sometimes Jeff, depending on the song. And, uh, and then Brian did his guitar solos on Cashing In. And then there was one more night of overdubs, but I came down with a bronch severe case of bronchitis the next day. Mm -hmm. And I was sick for two weeks, so I missed the mix down sessions. And I, they, uh, Rich and I think it was Rich and Ian visited me at home when I was recuperating with the mix, and I, they played it for me. And I was trying to like smile, like, "Oh, okay." I thought it sounded terrible. Huh. I had no idea what they were. I, I didn't. I was like, "Wait a minute, what did you do?" It sounds like shit. And it, by then, you know, the tour was booked, the record was being pressed. It was too late to do anything about it. And but it, it didn't take long for everyone to go. We don't like this mix. So right. what we'll, do, we'll, we'll put the record out. We'll go on tour. We'll come home and remix it. You know what? It, you know, now that you're mentioning it, I remember. And Pat Baldwin says the mix on the first press is different than the subsequent pressings. Yes, right? it is. Totally yes, it different. was. The, 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 the record first pressing was had a different mix. Completely was different. was was the remix overall every song remixed? Every song, huh. the entire record was remixed. The problem is, is that it wasn't an improvement. It right. wasn't, you know, they they did some of the things that I suggested, which was like panning right. Lyle's guitar on one side, Brian's on the other. Right. But the mix was very flat and a cued kind of dark and kind of muffled, and it just didn't work. And my bass, they did some sort of EQ on my bass that completely killed it, so it was very muffled sounding. Where you know the the bass sound on the original mix is way better, and so. In 82, in 88, sorry, Jeff called me. I was living in LA at the time. And he said, we're getting ready to do the CD of the entire complete discography. Sure. Ian and I have been talking about it and, I, and I've been talking with Brian a lot. I want to talk to you. We want to use the original mix on the CD. I said, fine. I mean, I was like, yes, yes. For the love of God, please. My bass sounds a thousand times better on that mix. Sure. Were you surprised when this turned up? <laughs> Yes and no. It's like, what? Excuse me? There's minor no. threat stuff out there that we haven't heard? Wow. No, no. I was the only one who wasn't surprised by that because the second night of tracking for Out of Step, I sat down with Don because I wanted Don to teach me how to record. He was he still is to this day my mentor. I do what I I, I do what I'm able to do now because he taught me. And sure. the first time, the first thing he had me do was a rough mix of the entire session for Out of Step hmm. by myself, just him and me. He showed me how to set up a rough mix and I I recorded it to a cassette and I took that cassette home and that rough mix was basically uh, so much better than either mix of that record. And it had every single song on it, including In My Eyes, Filler and The Full Adams Family. Mm -hmm. So I've always had that mix with me. I see. I see. I digitized it years ago, remastered it. I, I've given it to a handful of people like Dave Grohl and Nate Mendel. So, so it's always something no. you 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 knew. Yeah, it, it and wasn't. Ian knew surprise. I had it too. Right. And so when Poison, my band, current band, Poisonous H, um, went in to record, start recording our album in August of 2021 at Inner Ear, because Don said he was closing the studio in October of 2021. So we went in in August. We had one night to track half the record, old school, and we did. 
when I came in, Ian and Don were coming out. And I'm like, and they're and they looked at me. It's like, hey, we just mixed those songs. Remember all those songs from Out of Step that we didn't release? And I was like, yeah, in my eyes, Phil Adams family. He's like, yeah, we just mixed those. And I said, oh, great, for what? And they were like, we don't know. And I thought, oh, okay, well, hey, I'm glad you did it. That's great because they had digitized the eight tracks and they went in and remixed it. And apparently, and Don was like, it sounds amazing. Holy crap. And I thought, yeah, I remember. I, I've never not had a copy of those recordings, but everyone yeah. else had lost those recordings or didn't even remember we'd done them. Sure. Fast forward to this past November. And um, since October of 2021, we went, Holly and I went to the closing party for Inner Ear. <clears throat> and I hadn't seen Jeff in years, Jeff Nelson. And he was there and we kind of got back in each other's lives. Cool. Um, he still owns his house. He doesn't, he lives in Toledo now, but he still owns a house in Arlington and he's been working on it for a long time, re renovating it. And I started helping him. And so whenever he's in town, he and Holly and I hang out a lot. And last November I was at Jeff's house in Arlington and it was a second like Saturday, I think. And I was helping him and I get a text from Ian while I'm there. Now, Ian, you know, has a flip phone from 2007. He doesn't text people. So I was like, oh, shit. I you, got, you, got, you got to email him if you want to talk. To yeah, him. yeah, yeah. And I was like, I hope everything's OK. And then he left a message. He's like, hey, can you stop by the house, my house on your way home tonight? And I was like, I thought, yeah, OK. I, I called him I said, and I called him back. And we talked. And I said, yeah, well, we can stop by. I said, I'm with Jeff right now. He's like, oh, cool. And he, he can just drop you and we can hang up for, for minutes. So I was like, sure. So I go back out to Je I go back out into the yard with Jeff. I was like, Jeff, Ian just called me. He wants to. He wants to meet up at his house. Do you know what that's about? Jeff was like, no, I have no idea. I went, okay. You know, and that's not really a big surprise. So right. I went, okay. So we go to the house and we pull up behind in Ian's, you know, behind Ian's house in, Adam, in Mount Pleasant. And he's sitting on the back porch and he looks like the cat that just ate the canary. Mm -hmm. And I look at Jeff and I'm like, and Jeff looks like the cat that just ate the canary. And I thought, oh, uh, what is going on? Yeah, what's what are you guys up to? You guys are up to something. And I, 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 we, I walk up there and, you know, and Ian and I, you know, Ian and Jeff and I now have a very healthy adult middle-aged man relationship. That's awesome. There's a, and it's, it's very lovely. And it's, it's, uh, it, it's all under the bridge. Oh my God. So far under the bridge. And I love that because, you yeah. know, we know each other as men now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really nice. And we can laugh about what we were like as kids, but we can talk about all sorts of stuff now that we understand with all this sure. life experience under our belt. And it's fabulous. Mm -hmm. But when That's we talk true. about what we did do, it's often we laugh way more than anything else because, you know, one of the things people miss about Minor Threat, and understandably so, was that we had a Beatlesque sense of humor where we like we could work off each other. Everyone in that band has got an insanely great sense of humor and we just work off each other like Marx brothers kind of stuff. It's just all, and people miss that. Yeah. You know, people don't know that about us, but it's true and it's still true. And I, I step in, I, I sit down at his table and he's like, so remember those songs we recorded? He goes, I know you have that rough mix. You remember those songs we recorded that we didn't put out? And I said, yeah. I said, the ones that you and Don mixed, right? And he's like, yeah. And he flips up the seven inch. It's he's got it like behind his back and he's like here. And I was like, oh, shit. And they were printed up already. They were done. They were. Yeah, they, he had he had them. And, and he and Jeff were like, surprise. Oh, is, is that is that tie in with the shot you sent me? Hold on. I yes. find this. Of you on the porch. Of Holly and I on the porch. Yeah. Yeah. Where the hell is that? Hold on. I'm going to find that. Keep keep That's talking. A great shot. Find it. Yeah. So they were like, we, uh, you know, it's the 40th anniversary of a Step. You know, we had this, we had these newly mixed versions of these songs and we thought <clears throat> we're going to release this. And they were like, and there I am, you know, my 18 year old self staring right at the camera with Don. And I'm like, and you know, I remember that picture. I've had that picture for years. Rich Moore, our roadie took that picture that night. Jeff documented the entire session. There's like 20 pictures from that session. Yep, there's me and Holly at Discord. That's last November um, with the 7-inch, getting ready to mail it out. Just like the old days, we went we went to Discord with Jeff on a Sunday. And was the 7-inch like a booklet? They look really thick. 
Oh no, it's just we got these mailers. Uh, oh, okay. From uh, from furnace pressing. Oh, I see. We weren't using, okay. and we just okay. <laughs> we just used those. They were very thick. Got it. Got spent, it. And and they they made your hands turn black. We spent <laughs> literally hours that day, cutting, pasting, folding, inserting, just like we used to do with the original Discord seven inches in the living room at that very house when right. we were kids. We'd get together and we. would we glue and cover and, and get those records ready for release. You know, people think that they just came in like that. They didn't. We we no. put them together. Yeah. They came as just, you know, print, you know, printed covers with the seven inches and sleeves, and we put them together and get, send them out. So we did the same thing, but they were they were like, This is a surprise. You can't tell anybody. We we don't want this getting on the internet. We don't, you know, we don't want anybody knowing about this. And I was like, nope, you know, Holly's the only person I'm gonna tell. And they show and they just they kept like, and you're on the back cover. And you're on both sides of the label and you're on the inner sleeve and you know and isn't this amazing and i was like yes they they did a good they, right. did, they did a good job not saying anything about it oh my god no one like all of a sudden there. all of a sudden it was bam it was and it was available here and get it now and it was like holy shit yeah you know? people people wigged and it i mean Why? you know this, this there's this re really popular record store in dc called crooked beat and they posted their um, their top ten sellers for Christmas nineteen, you know, Christmas twenty twenty three. Number one was Out of Step, seven outtakes. Right. Like number three was fucking Pet Sounds, and I thought, Wow, I'm out selling Pet Sounds. Yep. Okay, you know what? That is never going to happen again. So. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs>